The face. You needed a quick shave. Quick shave? Oh, shush. Shush, you. I just played half an ad to nobody. Yes. Oh, yeah. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change these words so that they say, uh, we're doing the Weird Things podcast. This is our new style guide. <laughs> I love it. I don't love having to rediscover where everything is, but that's how learning works, huh? Almost by definition. <laughs> yeah. Uh. I guess uh, it did go live with the word weird things, so we have that going for us. Good. And we can hit record at the right time. Let's put this up there, and I'll see here. Oh, there we go. Hello. Weird things. Age weird location. Uh, let me let me pull this down. Um, can we do a little mic checking? Check, check, check. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, good, two, three. Andrew. Oh, 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 you're silent now. The mute button works, everybody. Hey, Just checking. Hey, it. <laughs> okay, and then let me see if I can figure out where this overlay goes. There we go. Okay, yay. All right, we'll do the Weird Things podcast. We're getting there. Yes, it says great night. Don't worry about it. Uh, you're going to have a great night after we do the Weird Things podcast. Exactly. Uh, let me look at your solo duo, you two. Uh, and then, Andrew, I could take a couple of seconds to try to punch in on this on, uh, if you care. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Here, I, I was going to Zoom. Oh. Nope. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Ah, ah, <laughs> ah, <laughs> my brain. Uh, right, um, Max one Y. Let's do one point two, one point two, and I think we're done. One point two and one point two. There we go. Look at hey, look at that. Now, look at you two. Now I'm gonna save as, and now we have a weird thing set up. Brian understands weird things. WT1. Okay. All right. We're all good. So I'll set this up. And then um, uh, I will count you in so I don't have to do hard work on the editing. Uh, you ready? Yo. Okay. A little bit more noise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. Ready. Three. Two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Well, hello, Andrew Main. How are you? Fantastic. And Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hi, friends. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's 2024. Hey! We, we slayed, did it! We slayed the dragon, the 2023 dragon. It's dead, and now we uh, we get to live anew. Uh, 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 well, what was it uh, in Logan's Run? It was car Carousel. Renew. Carousel. Renew. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was uh, a lie. Yeah, those of you who don't know, uh, the, I think it was John Brunner who wrote the book. Um, in the book, Logan's Run, it was like a society. I think that, I think that they end a life to you. You know, I killed like at twenty one, and I think for the movie they changed it to thirty, uh, <laughs> and, because because there there weren't enough talented actors to, <laughs> that were pretty, under the age. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You know, Michael York's interested. Ah, bad news. Uh, listen, yeah. uh, but it, it was one of those. It was a. I'm gonna look that up. See if that was John Burner. But anyhow, it was this genre of fiction that became popular in. 
the 60s and 70s, you had Make Room, Make Room by Harry Harrison, which became Soylent Green, um, because, you know, we were convinced that, you know, we were going to have this, you know, because we're watching population post-World War II population mm. go up. We were watching the uh, Tonight Show with Paul uh, Ehrlich William constantly F- yeah, talking uh, about uh, this. Yeah. William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson wrote Logan's Run. I was completely wrong on that. Um, so, but anyhow, like, yeah, the population's increasing, et cetera. And yeah, that was like, people thought like you had those, you know, Club of Rome and all these statistics and stuff about that. And so fiction was like, you know, Clockwork Orange is about like a fear of young people. And like, did, did I already spin for you my yarn about Clockwork Orange? I, I, I think we talked about it on here. Did, did you know that a Clockwork Orange has two different versions one in America, one in England, and they both have different lessons at the end. Have we talked about this? Mm-hmm. No, no. So uh, uh, the 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 version in England is uh, first of all the protagonist of A Clockwork Orange, is, Alex Delange, is uh, fifteen years old. <laughs> which uh, this is, is this is this is the book or the movie? Uh, the uh, the book. Uh, well, the book. I think in the movie he's supposed to be the same character, right? Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. But, 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 but the you're, 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 books yeah. were two different versions. There we go. Yes, correct. And um, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, when it was released in. Well, I'll tell the American version first. Uh, there, there's a lot of delightful linguistic tricks that they do. The uh, the type of language that they speak. You know, real horror show, tall chalk on the Gulliver, a uh, little bit of the old in, out, and out, ultra violence, all that stuff. Um, that that that's some slang that uh, uh, Alex Burgess wrote, um, and they, much like Dune and other sh- stories, they included a glossary at the end so you could understand what the heck is any of this. Um, so I recently went back and listened to the audiobook. And uh, the Audible version, in fact, this will be my pick at the end. The Audible version, the guy is so good at internalizing the rhythm and flow that even though they're all nonsense words, you know what he's saying. You're talking about, I stole this money from this old woman, even though he uses none of those words. Um, The English version had a redemption arc at the end. And uh, it was about how... Yeah, it, it, the the lesson of the English version was essentially, yeah, teenagers be all fired up, but eventually they calm down and they become your parents. And in fact, this whole ending chapter, which which I kid you not, brought me to tears, uh, was about how, you know, uh, it, it, because Alex gets cured of the terrible, you know, uh, torture that he's gone through, and he goes back to the gangster lifestyle, but then he's bored by it and he begins to have this weird thought like maybe I'll settle down with someone and make a baby and you know what yeah that baby's going to think I'm a dumb boring old normal person but I guess that's the way of it all isn't it and then he does so it's a story of redemption whereas in America who was going through uh, the Vietnam war they're like well you can't have this bow at the end It has to be a story about science run amok torturing someone. And uh, then he uh, uh, finally gets back his feral instincts. And the book ends with, oh, I was back. All right. And then that is the version that became the movie that we all know. Uh, It's 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 uh, I, I, I was really blown away by the difference between those two. Yeah, reading about uh, his Anthony Burgess's opinions on that, and in fact, he actually was sort of ambivalent. He's apparently when he wrote a screenplay, his own screenplay version, he left out that end chapter and left it where it was on a darker tone. So, well, in and he uh, uh, in the uh, in the foreword for I believe it's the early nineteen nineties version, he said <laughs> some version of. Yeah, the only thing I didn't love about this book is spending 20 years defending it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it's it's a great audiobook read. Uh, like the audiobook, if you look at the Amazon reviews, I think the audio uh, the physical book has like 
four stars, but the audiobook has five stars, and it is purely because the lyrical it's it's fascinating to know exactly what they mean without them ever having to say it. Yeah, I don't I don't know how I feel about a ending where the murderous rapist gets redeemed and gets to live a normal life. I mean, in 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 a lot of ways, it's it's not a redemption. It's almost a more cynical ending. That yeah. like, yes, these are your parents. Like this person, yeah. that they become the power structure and and yes it they don't want to go out and do it right now but they did do it and maybe they didn't pay the price they should have yeah well and and you're right i'm not gonna say rede- well i mean first of all i guess it is a little bit of redemption you heard it here brian says murder is okay well that's the other thing as long as I you procreate is all the crimes are petty crimes there's only one murder and it's an accidental manslaughter now, yes, there is a lot of rape, and that's terrible. That's worse. Uh, but um, uh, it's, I don't know, it's fascinating. I, I, I highly recommend listening to the audiobook of the English version uh, just just because it is it is a subversion of what we know that story as. Mm-hmm. So as we look back at that genre, uh, the, remember the movie Silent Running? Uh, I don't. I don't think I ever saw it. Me Silent either. Running was directed by Douglas Trumbull, who did later on did uh, uh, Brainstorm. Silent Running was had Bruce Dern, and basically it's this this spacecraft that has the last forests on Earth have now been put into space, sent off into space because Earth is too polluted, and they got these spacecraft and he's kind of like hanging out talking to these robots and stuff. And the idea is, you know, we're going to destroy our environment so much so that we're just going to be able to, we just have to go launch all the remaining trees into space. <laughs> it's another. Makes sense. Strax. Super. Ah, oh, it's crazy. I haven't seen that. Um, another. It, it's, there's this trend, like the cliche and like eco. There was a one where uh, that William Defoe trying to hunt down like the last Tasmanian tiger. And then like this. I'll spoil the ending for it, but like they need the spaceships back or whatever. And he decides just to like blow everything up. <laughs> and it's just like, and there's a the thing, there's like the William Defoe hunting a Tasmanian tiger. Where he decides to kill it to prevent it from being captured. Our son is weird. Like I don't quite get this. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, they're very the, and nihilistic. This, this is around what time in human times? Oh, silent running. Um, that that, that probably would have been early twenty twenty four. Oh, really? The movie came out in the seventies. Okay, uh, yeah. The, the movie was like nineteen seventy six. Look at silent running. Uh, nineteen seventy two. You know, that's one of those things that I I say a lot in the in the political world whenever we talk about things being particularly chaotic or or uh, toxic. I always point to like, hey, you know, like. We were averaging two American leaders assassinated per five years for most of the most of the 60s. Like we were killing these people at a pretty high clip. Uh, uh, We did get through it. But but you look at some of the art that came of people that grew up through the 60s into the 70s. And there is just this like deep, deep cynicism of like maybe we're not cut out to run the planet maybe maybe we're the bad guys uh, uh that is that is a, a a a a theme that emerges i i, I almost certainly will be getting this wrong but i want to say that like in the 1970s there were two thousand bombings a year <laughs> like uh just like civic anarchy. civic bo- like, like like people were exploding bombs in towns not like military bombing correct correct yeah. yes yes like like acts of terrorism yeah yes yeah, uh, some European countries are catching up on that now with the bombings, the grenade attacks. So yeah, you know, one time uh, our friend Darren Kitchen, uh, who lived across the street from the Oakland courthouse, watched a bomb go off and it didn't even get reported on the news. What? Yeah, it was during one of the riots. I forget which. It was the pandemic. It was a thing to do at the time. Everybody was but a little bit kooky. Everybody. Well, uh, yeah. This was this was when riots were super rad and everybody was high fiving. Um, but yeah, bomb just goes off in City Hall and it didn't even make the news. It was just like, well, I guess we'll replace some windows. Wow. Uh, 
stuff be crazy. So now we look at where we're headed and we realize population decrease is a real thing. It's a real factor. You know, the depopulation. Uh, our inability to our fertility rates dropping. I, I, well, I think part of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're just not, you know, not replacement. There's a point where we were going to reach where we're not going to be able to replace ourselves. And I'll, you know, it's funny because I'll get in conversations and I maybe have this too. People are like, well, it looks good. And I'm like, I'll people like, you know, I've talked to people like, well, I think we should have fewer people. I'm like, well, why, why are you here? I'm like, am I like, I, that always baffles me that, that, you know, should be fewer people. Okay. Who, 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 yeah. start naming who names. Who goes? Start telling. Who stays, who yeah. goes? <laughs> yeah. Who, who gets voted who gets off the people? planet? <laughs> Yeah, and then and it's then you know it's some couples they don't want to have kids or whatever you know choose not to have kids which is which is fine but I'm like well we just feel like in this I'm like what do you mean like like I don't know I I just I don't get it I don't I don't feel like I it's a logically thought through conclusion well I I would agree with you that I don't think that cynicism should drive your decisions especially for us right now in this country at this time. Uh, uh, if anyone's going to do well for the next 100 years, we're, we're, we're among the list, right? You know, you never know what's going to happen. You never know something that's going to totally shake up everything. But based on everything we know now, we're going to be okay. We're, 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 you, you'd want to be American amongst other uh, uh, people that would make that top 10 list. So cynicism out and out is, I think... That's wrong. That's I, I, I try to fight against that. If anything, the two things that I try to, especially in the fields that I'm in, like politics, I really, really, really actively try to fight against cynicism and fatalism that like there are weird things about our system. There are uh, quirks in the in, in everybody else's beliefs. But the the wholesale, you know, hugging and, and believing in, in this fatalist concept that nothing matters and we're all going to die. And, and that kind of stuff I think is just corrosive in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, again, people decide they're not going to kids. It's fine. I just meant the whole idea of like, because the earth, the world or where it's going, I'm like, it's yeah. never been better to be a person. Never yeah. better to be a kid. You know, it's like, it's just, uh, but yeah, we, we we're so shaped by the world around us, but, uh, and I, I will say is that, you know, and we are always nostalgic for a past that doesn't exist. You know, I've had a conversation with somebody at dinner and some politician from 50 years ago. Oh, they were a great guy. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, like that person was worse than somebody we had today. Yeah. It's just, you didn't know, you know, you just, you just bought into whatever, you know, description of this stuff. I said, if this person was around today, like, I don't think they would have been electable. And it's like, and you just realize that like that, the hazy filter of which we look at the past. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like, look, uh, uh, I, I got into this conversation about media that uh, like, Oh, well today the media is terrible. Like it, we long for the days of a Walter Cronkite. And it's like the <laughs> day that the day that Kennedy got assassinated, he insinuated on live television to a captivated rapt audience that Barry Goldwater killed him. Like that's a <laughs> thing that that's a thing that happened to the point where people were slamming on Barry Goldwater's campaign offices before more information came out. But in that vacuum, there was an insinuation that this was Barry Goldwater's fault. And it's like, that's horrendously irresponsible. Like that's a level of irresponsibility that Twitch streamers get in trouble for like in, in, in 2024, let alone a guy who was talking to a third of the country at any given moment, probably more because they had a greater market share. He did have a yeah, great it's voice, one of the though. Yeah, it, it's one thing that's really poorly understood because we go like, oh, I liked it back. I'm like, there are people that love the whoever is doing the, the whoever the premier broadcaster in North Korea is, you know, who think this guy's great and comforting and stuff. Like, yeah, it's because you just what you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. not to turn this into some, you know, <laughs> Noam Chomsky anti media sort of thing, but it is literally, we, we, we only, we have the most resolution. We have a lot of resolution about the past, but we choose not to use it. We have very little resolution on the present and just make it fill up that gap with assumptions. Yeah. So I think, yeah, no, but things are good. 2024 is going to be rad. It's going to be cool. 
people are going to smile a lot. You're going to laugh a lot with your friends. You're going to make some goals. You're going to you're going to check them off. This is this is going to be this is going to be a a, a a a great year. And if there's challenges, congratulations. It'll be like every other year where you have challenges. Sometimes they're greater, sometimes they're lesser, but we're we're, we're going to get through it. We're 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 doing awesome. If you're listening to us right now, congratulations. You're at the height of humanity. <laughs> please please try to enjoy it. I, I'd like to think so. I was at a New Year's Eve party and I was talking to a woman who said, oh, yeah, my husband would like to meet you. He's a portfolio manager and he handles AI stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And he says 2024 is going to be a great year. I'm, I'm like, OK, as a, as a fund manager, say this. He goes, yeah, because he's really into feng shui and he says the numbers are good for 2024. Oh, it's Jesus. Number. OK. All <laughs> I'm right. like, oh, my God. God, and he's a fund manager. Take, <laughs> like, take, oh. take it back, take it back. <laughs> I think, I think, oh. I think I've, I've I've told this story before, but I was at a, uh, a I think a Reason conference, and I'm I'm at this like party outdoor gathering, and everybody's talking, and there's this one very tall, charismatic guy, and he's telling a story about uh, uh, the overreach of the federal government, which is a thing that happens when you're at Reason meetings. Uh, that, that is that is something that just comes up, yeah. and he starts talking about, oh, well, you know, here is they carry monetary policy and the intelligence overreach and blah 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm in my like mid twenties at this point. I'm like, man, that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And he goes, and that's why they killed Kennedy. And I'm like, oh no, oh god, jeez, oh, oh, no. I was having a good time here, and now I got to go review the tape over everything you said. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it is. A, it's interesting because they had some of the Epstein names came out yesterday, uh, and, and uh, fewer surprises than I was than than the media would lead us to think on that. I would say, too, that, like, I don't want to veer too politically here, but I would say that, like, there are a number of people in, I'd say, conservative media who are saying, oh, you know, well, they didn't give you the full list. There's more there. And I'm like, man, this sounds a lot like the whole Russia things with Trump allegations. Yeah. Like, they, other that side's going, oh, yeah, there's a lot more that didn't come out. And here, like, the lot, I'm like, you're kind of saying the same thing yeah. about this. Yeah. I don't know. I thought like I I read I didn't, I haven't read the whole uh, uh, unredacted uh, uh, information that came out, but the stuff I read was like I don't know matters to me when you put that stuff in context and you put names next to acts and things that happen. Uh, uh, I mean, we knew a lot of the names. I don't think that there was anything that we were like like what like Pat Sajak. Like it was. It, I mean, I guess maybe there were there were a few. Boy, that would have. <laughs> Now we've besmirched Pat Sage. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, there there were some like Hollywood people that I didn't know, but but they weren't stars at the time. They they the intervening time in between, they they made a career. But uh yeah, I, I, I think I think it matters. I thought it was I thought it was important for, for, for that stuff to be released because it it matters to see Prince Andrew's name with things that he did. Like that's I, I like those sentences, those full and complete sentences, as opposed to saying all this stuff happened, separate paragraph. Here are names linked to Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Put them together. It, it, the context is much better because it's like, because there was, you know, I'd heard names like, oh, and Epstein. I'm like, well, you know, I knew people who knew him because he was in this, taking scientists out to dinner and giving grants and stuff to orgs and stuff, you know, and, and, you know, then kind of that, that the, the insinuation, my favorite is like some people who hate Elon Musk will show this photo of Elon Musk and then just Lane Maxwell, like two feet, three feet behind him, photo bombing. Yeah. And, you know, and trying to imply like, you know, there's some connection there when you look at it, like, clearly he doesn't even know she's in the photo there, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, look, they were socialites. They were out there. They were shaking hands. They were taking pictures that, you know, uh, various different functions. It's it's really when you go to the island and people who are <laughs> suing in civil yeah. court for to get damages because the government couldn't bring criminal prosecutions against them say like, oh, I myself viewed the following orgies with underage women in the Bahamas. Like that's that's something that matters, especially when they're, you know, elites that have a lot of sway in this world. Yeah.
I I've said this. I don't know if I've said the public. Yeah, I met Epstein before. And, Whoa. Uh, not on the island. Uh, let me be very clear. Uh, if you're involved in scientists or stuff like this, you know, there was a point where uh, met him, talked to him, couldn't quite figure out. There was something off about him. He was a guy that was very, I l- realized later on, because I had to go, what do you do? He goes, oh, I'm a, I have a black box trading fund, whatever. And he was actually describing some other, he basically just ripped off the biography. of. So I didn't know that at the time, but I'm like, it was weird. He just seemed like another one of these kind of blowhard kind of guys that likes to try to look wealthy and tanned and whatnot. But which, which, know. which, by the way, is about 12 to 15 percent of all South Florida. That guy, that exact guy, a tan person who wants to act more rich than he is. That's like a sizable, a measurable on the census part of the the the, the tri county South Florida area. They are. They are they're on the loose out there. Yeah. Yeah. 2024 predictions. Ooh. Is uh, is Artemis supposed to go to the moon this year? If the answer is yes, then my answer is no. <laughs> So you, you uh, are taking the under. I'm taking the under. Yeah, point, that... point 0.5 Artemis missions to the moon. Brian is submitting his ticket, and it is under. Yeah, let's see. The next scheduled Artemis mission is... Drum roll, please. Um. I mean, I know it's not this year. Uh, uh, SLS block. Okay. One B is scheduled to launch twenty twenty eight. SLS block two. Okay. Twenty so after twenty twenty nine. So. Okay. So. Well, uh, start holding the, your breath. Brian's so, already got the first winning prediction of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um. Do uh 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 oh uh I guess I guess uh, th- here's an annual one for us. Um, the uh do we expect uh, Starship to uh, fly past the Carmen line and get back safely? The it, I you know I always try to take the overly optimistic. Um, I mean, by the way, I want to be optimistic as well. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I always try to take the overly optimistic thing. Um, so <laughs> the I think they're scheduled like the next month or so to try something. Uh, I, I I is it public information how many starships have been made or the rate at which they're being which they're being made? We we talked about it comparing it to Boeing aircraft aircraft a while ago. Imagine Daffy Duck. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, the thing is because the yard, there's so many cameras aimed there, they can see when these things are being built. Elon had said that they're working on V2 of it, basically after their, their launches. The, the ones they're building now are Starship V2 with some different changes for it. So they're. I know that they're trying to do... I heard a thing that I didn't quite understand because they said they were going to try to try to like next one is going to try to do some experiment with refueling but i'm like we kind of got to get it into the air first i mean but, they, they've got it in, into the air well, into orbit the, sorry yeah yeah, orbit, yeah yeah into 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 the the air air all the way up super and, plus yeah. air well out of the air get it away from get the it air. away uh, <laughs> afuera, <laughs> afuera. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know. I know that, you know, they, they have their own pace, but I've heard that they were looking to try to do a new launch early this year. So, uh, well, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, I promise you, I have no pies, uh, in my arsenal. Uh, if you wanted to place a bet in 2024, uh, uh, do you think they cross the Carmen line and make it back safely in a starship? People are just, Oh, uh, uh, just SpaceX. Like, uh, yeah. Robotically. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would be surprised if they don't land one this year. I'd be surprised. Is the the SpaceX is got a ton of money. They've got you know they're they're the most. The thing to think about SpaceX is SpaceX is 
not just the leading launch provider right now, their launch, the amount of stuff they put into orbit by mass is greater than every the rest of the world combined. Jeez Louise. So they've got a very viable machine for producing rockets, putting, they have money coming in. They're, they're, they, they, you know, they picked up, there is a Europe, just the ESA European space Agency just released this, like the year of the booster or something to talk about this. And the one thing they didn't mention was the rocket they had to use to get the Galileo space probe into orbit, which was a SpaceX booster ah. because their own booster wasn't ready. Um, Amazon wants to do their own, I think their Kuiper, you know, satellite array, their own sort of like for internet. And they were going to use Blue Origin. They're going to use Blue Origins. Yep. And they finally said, you know, I know we want to use the boss's uh, uh, rocket company, but we're kind of facing uh, corporate malfeasance if we don't use the actual company putting things into orbit instead of waiting, 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 waiting. So that was a bitter pill for them to have to swallow was, kind, you know, Kuiper, which was the Amazon project to go to SpaceX in a contract with them to put stuff into orbit because that's how viable. So my point is to say they've got a ton of money, ton of engineering talent. They can they can keep throwing more resources at this and they seem to be they keep making progress. You look at the rate of progress for Starship for a program that was really started just a few years ago comparatively to the the SLS that what we've seen it do and its capabilities just it seems to be at a, at a, at a great pace, you know, and like, you know, and that's, I, I wish I would part of it would say it's hard. Cause it's like, you know, when NASA had done studies, feasibility studies on reusability of upper, of upper stages and lower stages, they've, they've had a lot of brilliant people. There was a period of time for decades where the smartest people in aerospace were, you know, for the most part, all at NASA, you know, if you didn't want to work on war machines, you went there. And so they did a lot of great research on stuff, but you know, NASA's got, multiple problems working against it one is you know they to get funding in the way that our political system works is they've got to throw that funding at select companies like sls was not like an open submission for hey help us build something to put stuff into orbit it was literally help us build a rocket that uses a space shuttle engine and a saturn 5 technology or whatever and well i wonder i wonder who's gonna win that one <laughs> you know um you know, I so anyhow, point is, is that there is SpaceX is a great position where they can make mistakes, they can try things, and even traditional space companies too. You know, like ULA, uh, you know, Tony Bruno, who runs ULA, they were supposed to have their Vulcan rocket take off. And Elon Musk had famously said like five years ago, says if they run a national defense payload by 2023, I'll eat my hat with mustard, you know, yeah. and safe. Completely, yeah, did, they didn't. And Bruno and them were like, oh, no. And it's like, man, it's hard. It's hard. So my point is, yeah, I think I think that the fact that they keep getting things launched, I think they're going to I think they're gonna get something up. Justin, you got a prediction? Oh, predictions. Predictions. I wholeheartedly believe there'll be a presidential election. Okay, all right. Uh, actually, uh, can you chime in on the current... That is kind of a bold prediction, according to some, Justin. I know. <laughs> I know. Wait, wait. Uh, actually, here's the real question. Will everybody agree who is president on election night? No. no. Yeah, I agree. No. And I we agree. never have. <laughs> we never have in the last 20 plus years. We've never agreed. Isn't that wild? Yeah, the 2000, I mean, we. it's funny, like, I watched this, uh, the election denial, I'm like, where were you in 2000? Like, like we were, you're, you know. I went to the Supreme Bush Court, Court Yeah, man. 2000, 2000 was protracted. There were mainstream journalists that insisted it still was robbed. Like, and that was like, like, we've never had this point where we all, good job, best guy won, move on. That you want to know existed. what, now, I'm, I'm trying to think, because 04, I remember John Edwards going out and telling their crowd to go home and they conceded the next morning. 2016, Hillary did the same. I think McCain might have conceded to Obama and Romney conceded to Obama uh, in 08 and 12. But you're you're we're not I'm not talking about the candidates. I'm talking about the 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 media and that. And what oh, happened OK, if, OK, OK. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, as far as the media goes, sure. Like, I mean, that, that there's there's been a uh, 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 
there has been disconnect. But I, I'm just talking about like whether or not people have conceded. Yeah, I meant I meant that that even after Hillary conceded, there was the long. Well, we could still fight it in Congress. Oh, it sure. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, no, no. That, that, I mean, all yeah, that, that. All that is yeah. old hat. It. It is. It yeah. is very much old hat. Uh, there's. Um, yeah. I, I. 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 I don't know what. What I do think is something that we should correct because I don't think that it builds in. Uh, it builds in confidence into the system, is. Uh, having the election be something that as far as any outside observers cannot be called until like days or weeks afterward. Uh, I think that is, that is corrosive. And obviously if it's something extraordinarily close, which is the Florida election or the election that tilted on Florida in 2000, that was, you know, uh, 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 statistically a fraction of a fraction of, America's populace that did wind up deciding it. That's something I think, okay, special circumstances if it's like that, but uh, where, where multiple states can't get their act together, hopefully it's better than it was in 2020, but I don't have a lot of faith that it's going to be much better than it was in 2020, considering how many states spun up uh, a lot of mail counting operations that they were not prepared for, and uh, uh, they still haven't corrected it, a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, I kind of have a, a, a prediction not that goes beyond this year. So back in 2019, um, there was, uh, let's see if I can share this video with you all. Uh, back in 2019, OpenAI, before the release of GPT-3, they had a robotics division. And one of the things the robotics division had worked on was basically using a thing called reinforcement learning, which is letting the machine learn by itself. And the idea that instead of you trying to program in a specific movement or something like this, you give it a goal, you let it try to get close to the goal. And then as it kind of gets better at that, eventually over time, it learns. Mm -hmm. It's the same way you think about how GPT-3s work, where basically it's able to do deep learning. It'll learn how to understand stuff. The same thing can be applied with movement. And so... We're trying to build robots that learn. A little bit like humans. Oh, you know what? Uh, sorry, we got uh, competing audio happening right now. What we've done is train... They built a uh, robotic hand. And the, the thing about this robotic hand was they gave it the task of... Basically, like, you know, already knew the algorithm for solving a Rubik's Cube, but it had to figure out how to move the Rubik's Cube, basically mm. how to figure out how to manipulate it. And so there's sensors in the fingertips, and you watch it as it bounces it around and moves it around. It starts to learn and figure out how to get the feedback to it. And basically, they built, you know, a robotic hand. And I've seen a hand at the OpenAI, you know, offices, but they like built a hand that could actually do this. Eventually, once they realized GPT-3, they wanted to focus on that. That team became a big part of the API team. But this was a really interesting, and this has continued to progress. Boston Dynamics and other people have worked on their own versions of this. So basically, you know, how can you use computers? How can you use AI to basically do dexterous things? And we just saw, um, you know, here, the thing about this was they tried to do it. That's Wojciech. That was the guy who worked on Codex. Uh, you see it here. They're tr it's solving the thing while they're throwing all these distractors on the hand. They're tickling the hand. They're moving things in front of it. And this shows you the strength of a learning algorithm. And basically, a learning algorithm get very good at even moving things in the material world. So uh, fast forward, and, you know, we have, um, did you see the latest uh, version of Tesla's Optimus Prime robot? No. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I know that they have developed the robot more, and I did see the... It sounded like a kind of a cheap pop of like a the, whatever something something trail of blood uh, factory robot thing that felt silly, but uh, 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 tell me about this. So they've been working on their robot. The first the thing is robotics. Like some of the things you'll see, like you watch it walk. They're algorithms. They're like specific algorithms for walking and other mechanics and stuff. And it's and it's if you know a little about it, you'll see stuff and you recognize scale. And that was when they showed their first version of the robot. People are like, that's a very old algorithm. That's old walking method. Come on, guys. And I've made the argument like Tesla's got some of the best engineers in the world. And now this is and I said they're going to adapt fast. This is their new robot. 
This is the generation two. Good Lord. That is smooth. What a difference. Yeah. We're watching the robot walk through a cyber truck assembly plant and it's 30% faster than what it was before. It's still got that kind of like arthritic walk, but it's better. It's a little more upright right now. I mean, that's fine and, as, as long as it's safe. It's like it, it can be slow as long as it runs all day, every day. I'll, I'll tell you what, more and more, I, I appreciate it. I, I feel seen. Uh, yeah. oh, <laughs> walking that way. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, fam, fam, I gate. see you, Jake Sully. I Watch see this. you. <laughs> They're showing it now. It's picking up eggs, and it's it's moving an egg from one hand to the next, and you know that's kind of a big deal. You know that's yeah. a big point of dexterity. And the thing that we're at is that we're going to see. I think in robotics, we are going to see a. We know now, like the idea that how many. I I think all of us here probably work with ChatGPT on a regular daily basis, and probably get engaged in conversations and back and forth. It is good enough now to do a lot of stuff. When I code, it is good enough to just code and work with. When we start, these systems start to get more, and even you could do a lot more to make GPT-4 even more capable. Like we're finding, like we talked about, Jim and I had their benchmarks, then Microsoft worked on some new prompts, and all of a sudden GPT-4 was beating Jim and I. It will go back and forth. But anyhow, when you talk about getting to a next level, like a GPT-5 or whatever could come next, that's when it gets spooky but the material side of it is where things have been lacking we haven't seen the same rate of progression with robotics and that's my prediction my prediction is that mm. for the next few years robots are going to get because a couple factors more attention more money thrown at it because now we know we have the computers that can manage it i could take one of these smaller gpt knockoff whatever or open source models run it on some local hardware and have a thing i could have a conversation with it and understand what i want algorithmically the idea that you might just need a few janky motors and a couple gyroscopes and the AI will figure out how to balance it, and make it walk without having to put $50,000 worth of sensors into it. That becomes a possibility too. Uh, uh, I, I a hundred percent believe it. Um, uh, it, it is astonishing how, um, I, 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 I I've not invested in a lot of different things, but uh, I, I have paid a fair bit of attention to the open AI system or whatever. And there, uh, you know, I bought, I bought a Apple iPhone specifically because you told me that you used the action button to go straight to uh, chat GPT. And I have found myself doing fast calculus of uh, which will take less time. For me to find, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on another podcast, but uh, which will take more time for me to find where the power button is on this Zoom F6 or whatever, or to just say, I'm holding this, where's the power button? And then, and, and it cut as dumb as that 20 seconds was, it, 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 it spared me of it. And I just find myself doing it more and more. And uh, I'm fascinating. I'm fascinated to see how many people still haven't realized how many little shortcuts they can do uh, for their life. Our, our, our friend uh, Andrew Heaton on, on a big road trip back from Oklahoma uh, said that he just learned from chat. He just had a conversation the entire way. Instead of listening to a podcast or an audio book, he just talked to chat GPT on his, uh, uh, through his car uh, about learning about whatever he wanted to learn about. He like he was listening to a book, had a thought, and instead of saying, oh, I got to remember to look that up, just had a conversation with uh, ChatGPT, which, granted, you should double check before you use that information for anything other than, you know, uh, 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 chatting with your friends. But still, that's that's really cool. That, that um uh, I think I already mentioned this, and I apologize if I'm repeating, but during the Christmas holiday, there was like an hour-long drive, and I needed to entertain my 10-year-old uh, uh, at the time, and uh, I was just like, what would it look like to stand on the surface of I.O.? And, uh, you know, describe for me a vivid visual scape of what it would be like. And, uh, you know, uh, 30 years of reading up on all this stuff, uh, as far as I know, it was accurate on all that stuff. It's like, oh, you'd see 
a little bit of atmosphere. You'd see you, the sky would be dominated by the visage of Jupiter and all that stuff. And it was a, uh, it was, it was like a custom podcast. It, it was wonderful storytelling at the time. It's, and it only gets better in in a few years' time, substantially better from here, which is awesome and terrifying. That is that is you know, as I sit there and I have conversations and stuff back and forth with it. And I'm like, and I, I think I maybe said this before, but I'll say this again. So when they were developing the mode right now, the conversation mode, uh, I was, I would, I would, I would say, I don't want to say I worked on, I was involved in that. And then I went to weekly meetings where they're showing the progress updates on it and had my dumb suggestions, but, um, watching the improvements of that, of being in a first, being in the room the first time. Yeah, that was demonstrated where all of a sudden, like, hey, back and forth, and it knew what to wait for the beats and stuff was amazing to sort of watch this have the conversation and respond back and go forth and then showing going up to the comms team and showing people there. And then fast forward a week or so ago, my wife is, you know, getting ready for bed, brushing her teeth, whatever. So I'm in the bedroom and I grab my phone and I decide I'm going to have a conversation, start talking to it about memory methods and I'm talking back and forth. And I was there watching it get it better and better and better. And I was still sitting there staring at my phone as I had this conversation with an AI and just was beside myself. Was yeah. Just, just, you know, was just like spooked out too. So uh, Dr. Chiron, 2024 prediction. Some in the AI industry will claim they reached AGI, yet they did not. Ha! <laughs> That's a perennial. That's every year. Well, but I, who, who, who? Well, what I don't think anyone's ever claimed it. Oh, yeah. Uh, what credible orgs ever claimed it? Yeah. I, uh, I would, oh, oh I, I'm sorry. I'm talking about individual people, like uh, the Google guy who was convinced that uh, <laughs> that that it was a yeah, sentient being. Guy that didn't even know how the stuff worked. That was <laughs> that was why that guy was given any credibility drove me nuts. Mm. Um. Uh. So I, maybe, and I don't want to. I don't want to dismiss that. That I, I would say though that what is AGI? How do you define AGI? Yeah. And and I will. We talk about people talk about the Turing test, and it is one of the most misunderstood things because what if you read Alan Turing's paper and what he was trying to describe, he was talking about how do you measure intelligence and not consciousness, not sentience. He was talking about intelligence. How do you know if you're talking to another intelligent being? How do you know this? And he's like, well, if we're on the other side of, uh, you know, a terminal and we're going back and forth and I, whatever question I ask it or whatever, if it satisfies my understanding of what it means to be intelligent, then I'd, I, in fairness, I have to say that thing is intelligent. And it became intelligence got conflated with, you know, sentience and consciousness and whatnot. And literally his point was trying to say, if you're trying to understand what intelligence is, then you have to be able to have a definition of it that can work when you don't get to see who's on the other side of it. And yeah. that was it. And, I, and, and, you know, it was an article that there was a paper that came out like, ah, chat GPT can't pass the Turing test. I'm like, well, what, you're saying is a model that was trained to tell you it's not a human succeeded yeah. in telling people it's not a human. Yes. If you're telling me you don't think a GPT four level model could pass that test with most people. If it uh, should, it, should it be weaponized for scamming or, or, by, or, the way, or by the way, our, our, yeah. our currently doing a better job at walking you through customer service. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. This is, this is happening now. I don't even mean weaponized. If you, if you, if you, you know, in Turing's test, he didn't imagine that, you know, we would try to put into rules into AI that has to tell you it's an AI. The fact that it says that because we put a rule in it says it tells you it's an AI, you go, aha, it can't pass. I'm like, that's kind of a technicality there. Like, if you're telling me, does it satisfy your understanding of what intelligence is? I would say that most people, yes, absolutely, these things are intelligent. Absolutely, these things are intelligent. You know, um, what that means beyond it, you know, an ant colony is intelligent. You know, there, there is, there's all kinds of emergent intelligence. There, slime so. mold but, is intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. I wish slime mold could, you know, help me with my Python programming, but not yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think that's the thing that people get kind of hung up on that. I would say that we look at the rate of which these systems are getting better. And so what is AGI And that, you know, we use the term at open AI, ASI, artificial super intelligence is something that exceeds human capacity. 
the definition we use of AGI is something that could do most work, most knowledge work a person could do more efficiently than a person. Because the idea is if you can have a data, a $5 billion data center that can do the work of one lawyer, that's not efficient. No. <laughs> you know, that's not, not really, even by the way, some lawyers charge. But if you can basically, you know, at 28 cents an hour for GPU usage, you're able to do what an average knowledge worker can do. That's the point. So, you know, when will we reach AGI? I don't know. The goalposts will keep moving. Uh, well, here's what doesn't keep moving. Patreon.com slash weird things. It's where you can support this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, appreciate your patience over the holidays. Obviously, a lot of travel and stuff. But we are back, friends. We are back. And uh, we are happy to be here. Patreon.com slash weird things. Gentlemen. So we think robots, we think we think spooky robots walking around. I'm I'm in. I'm I'm in for uh, uh I'm I'm very much of the belief that we are at the dawning of the next great epic of tech that we we spent a lot of time uh uh iterating and iterating and iterating on the last great one which i think was smartphones and uh that was obviously launching on top of the internet uh but between stuff like ai and what ai can mean for like robotics i think that we are we're going to be at a point like we were in the late 80s early 90s with the internet and like we were in the 2000s with the rise of smartphones and how much that just revolutionized society and culture i think we're we're here we're here again we we've had we've had a lot of we had a lot of false knocks at the door but it's we're back baby we're so back let me let me tell you what robotics really means the idea of getting robotics to the state of it's doing construction and other stuff there is a lot of talent in this world. The problem is talent is distributed unevenly. And sometimes to develop more talent, you need a long-term plan. If you want to have a developing comedy economy in the global South, if you want to have, you know, if you want to have more skilled electricians in Indonesia, you need more vocational schools. You need these sort of things to build it. And it's just, it's just hard, but you know, imagine you have, you know, 500 Gen 5 Tesla bots with, you know, a GPT-5 directing them and a bunch of construction materials, and you're able to build a vocational school in a matter of days or build a hospital yeah. with robot staff to assist humans who are going to be running the thing. Because you always want to have you always want to have humans at the center of it, even if they're just saying yeah or nay or got their hand on an off switch. But that's going to be kind of, you know, I think the goal. But you start to think about like, you know, we watch the Mr. Beast videos where they go to these reach these areas out in the remote, you know, parts of, you know, Africa and are able to, you know, build solar panels, build, provide Wi-Fi, provide things that we take for granted that, you know, we've been lucky because of the geography, economy, whatever, to have the density or whatever, and to have these things and the economic system allows for that. Other people haven't. And then you say, okay, you know, how do you, how do you make this easier? You know, poured concrete was a wonderful innovation. The ability of having poured concrete and understand how to make that work in mass, you know, allowed us to build cities and steel and things like this. And so you think about robotics, it just, the idea of, I think, I really think about what it can give to the people who don't have the resources we have, and that's exciting, you know? And so I think that we could see an, a major economic boost. By yeah. basically being able to develop infrastructure around the world. And part of infrastructure isn't just building the things. It's also building the vocational schools, the educational institutions, and that. So the people who live there, you know, get to. Are better. Yeah. Their lives the are skills, materially you know. better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not just because that's, that's the, to me, any, any, any future where it involves just throwing handouts to somebody else is a scary future because, you know one day, you know, I find myself just sitting there consuming all day long and what then? So, but I think, I think, I do think, I think a lot about like how robotics could make that. You think about too, like, you know, my parents are getting older, you know, would, you know, having a really capable robot around mm -hmm. the house. Robot parents. 
that too. How, how do my parents are getting older? I'm not a fan. They're kind of older models. I'd like maybe some with some cool red stripes. I I was reading a magazine about cooler parents. Hey, robot dad, do a backflip. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, do, uh, do you guys have picks? Yeah. All right. Well, here, while you are clearly thinking of one, uh, I'll double down on a Clockwork Orange, specifically the English version that uh, is an audiobook. Um, it uh, with the weird kind of you know moving on chapter. Um, uh, yeah. No, that's a uh, that's that's cool. Also, Lower Decks that, Brian continues to be good. Uh, my pick is going to be. I don't know how many more episodes are in this season, but the new Fargo is my favorite edition of the series thus far. It's electric. It's awesome. Juno Temple, who played the uh, uh, model from uh, Ted Lasso, Keeley, is against type amazing in this. Uh, uh, Joe Keery from Stranger Things is awesome in it, and John Hamm... You know, John Hamm is a weird actor because Don Draper was so iconic. I feel like people have just been casting him in either weird versions of Don Draper or John Hamm on SNL because they realized he was funny and he can play smarmy uh, well. Mm -hmm. This is a great, great role and, and allows him to be menacing and sinister in a very human way, in a, in a way that reminds you part of that Don Draper formula was he was kind of scary. Like, he had this past. Well, he, had, was, he had that darkness about him, he had, right? Yeah, there, yeah. Was, there was something where it's like, you know, if if there was a Mad Men plot line where Don Draper got angry and, and uh, uh, drunk at a bar and wound up beating somebody up and then he wound up dying, you'd be like, yeah. That kind of fits like there's there's an element of that. I don't think he would intentionally kill somebody, but I do think he would be angry. Well, enough. remember the Korean War start thing kind well, of the yeah. implied when he shows up. Yeah, there's I mean, there's anyway, this is phenomenal. And if it ends where I think it's going to end, they have set up a lot of a lot of things that that I feel like is building to a finale. It will be one of. It would be something that I have not seen explored in a heightened, creative way that Fargo obviously exists in this Cohen-esque. The characters are real. They're so real that they can do sort of weird things and you read them as a part of humanity and not a cartoon. And that's always the greatest thing about the Cohen's work and Noah Hawley for whatever... Uh, 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 sometimes he can get a little indulgent and, and he has in the past. This is the perfect, the perfect frequency uh, between the two. I cannot co-sign on this season of Fargo uh, more than I have. Excellent. So I have some man I've been trying, but I can't. Uh, Monarch Legacy of Monsters, like, I was very excited because it was one of these things that there's a lot of really good talent that was attached to it, but sometimes when you see too many names attached to something, you start to realize, like, oh, no. Yeah. Like, Monarch, I don't know if you've been watching that, but, like... is it, It's a TV show? Where, where is it? It is Apple, big budget, Apple, big budget, Monarch. It is the Godzilla universe, and it's about Monarch, the organization. It's got Kurt Russell. Um, it is probably one of the most expensive shows on TV and it's got Godzilla in it and whatnot. And uh, the fact that you don't know what it is tells you that it's not got a lot of word of mouth because it's not been great. And it, it's been a frustrating watch because there's this drama of these young people looking for their dad. That's like goes on episode after episode. And I don't care about them. I want the monsters to eat them and just get back to Kurt well, Russell I, and Godzilla. Uh, 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 just for clarification, I, I, isn't there another Godzilla something or other like 1948 or Godzilla minus one. Yeah. That, a movie one. yeah. that is out and that, but that is, yeah. that is a Toho uh, Japanese yeah. produced movie about 
baby Godzilla. <laughs> right. And, uh, uh, yeah. Proto before he gets juiced up. Yeah. Before he starts. Everybody loves that. Yeah. 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 And that the example, that was a $15 million budget, which is probably the budget for at least, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, barely i mean like one episode of this is probably that and it's just it's just this late there's this i could go on about my frustration with a lot of hollywood screenwriters and writers rooms and stuff and how producers how stuff gets made but you know there is i would say on one hand there's very much an argument to be made for having one passionate person driving this thing instead of a committee but then i watched rebel moon and then maybe i really want a committee because oh my god uh okay a, a quick Quick side jag. Uh, take me through the uh, 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 the whoopsie doodles in that one. What Rebel Moon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I I didn't see it. It's a Zack Snyder wrote and directed it and does DP on it. I mean, Zack Snyder by all accounts is a super nice guy. I friends are friends with him. Seems like a nice guy. But I mean, this is a everything like i know you like man of steel but like my prop man of steel is like i never got a scene i never got a scene in man of steel i got montage 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 yeah this is literally this is literally and it's funny because they go like ah oh, it's like you know magnificent seven or you know the the seven samurai you know like like it's it's like that you know it's like gathering the team together okay which i'm like yeah that was Battle Beyond the Stars in the 1970, like eight or nine movie, which was the one where they had this the Star Wars knockoff of trying to get this team together to go fight the things. How much it borrows people that rips off Star Wars, like oh, it rips off Battle Beyond the Stars and other Star Wars rip off. But it literally, Snyder had wanted to do a Star Wars film and pitched Lucasfilm a Star Wars film. They turned it down. And so basically, apparently, he went to Netflix and says, I have a great idea for a big space fiction franchise and series and stuff, which was really, it's one of these Star Wars films. There's literally somebody in there with lightsabers. And it's it's a movie where, like, they you know, everything's flashbacks or what are the main character core are, like, you find out her story because she's at a campfire says, you should probably know this about me. Flashback, slow motion, montage, slow motion, montage, slow motion. And now you know. <laughs> and you're like, am I invested in this? Yeah. It's just, you know, like, remember like the scene in Justice League where they're all standing up on a row and the camera passes by and it's like this poster moment. And you're like, what is what is the storytelling here? What are and they there's looking just at? tons of that. Yeah, like she she goes, she'd been, she'd been, she had this very Thanos like relationship with the bad guy who, you know, took over her world and adopted her because she had spirit. And then, you know, she became a big fighter for him. And then there's a scene where they show her standing on top of a hill with the flag for the evil empire and it's slow mo. And I'm like, like, that's like the Iwo Jima flag thing, but that meant something because that was like taking the island from the imperialist Japanese, which was a moment like, what, how am I supposed to? what why you're just you're just filled with this going like literally a movie made from i made a movie once based on storyboards and the plot sucked and it was literally it's like this will be a cool shot this will be you know, she's she's out there in the field and we're gonna have this big ringed planet behind her and then there it's just everything feels like a blue screen set Ugh, it is so I guess my point is like I don't know like I give the right people the money. But... <laughs> I uh, I I think I've gotten a bit of a a, a sketch about what I didn't miss. I, I, it is it is it is my dad like we were I did not want to watch it and we're spending Christmas with my dad and my dad's like do you guys want to watch Rebel Moon I'm like I'm not gonna watch that and I'm like it's my dad you know my dad wants to watch this movie my dad likes everything and and I'm like I'm like. I'll watch it with you, Dad. It took us two nights to get through it. And it is, it is, I like Zach, let me, I like him as a person. I like him as, I love his energy. I have wanted to root for something that is not, he's not a director that I'm like, eh, I'm like, I like the guy. You know, he seems to be a great guy. People worked on set with him, like him, you know? I just, Nolan, like Nolan has been friends with him, and Nolan will say these things that you read, like, oh, Nolan endorses that. I'm like, read it closely. That's the guy rooting for the person he likes, but not saying, I'm going to have a conversation of film theory with him. But anyhow, so uh, Rebel Moon, I'm extremely frustrated. And I I have a theory, which I shared with you before. Like, I, 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 I suspect because you see this in Rot like Rotten Tomatoes is because isn't really a reliable source because like the studios know how to game it. 
and also angry fans know how to game it. People yeah. who don't like a thing, it is this push and pull, and there's stuff on there. You're like, I don't, I don't, I never look at the critic scores now because it's like, well, you and know, also so it's and a, so we, we that that mattered when we had a lot of critics for whom their careers mattered based on their opinions, and we just don't have yeah. that anymore. The the entire infrastructure for what used to make that that job a thing that you would really care about is just kind of gone. Here, here, here's how I look at a Rotten Tomatoes. I look at the audience score, and this is how I look at the audience score. I go, are non-fans watching it? If yeah. non-fans are watching this, I will put a lot of value into the score. If I know the only people that showed up to go watch that are the fans, then I'm not so much into it. But it can tell me something like, you know, I I'm never watched the One Piece cartoon. Right? Yeah. And I hear I'll hear all things about One Piece, One Piece, One Piece. And I watch it the first 10 minutes. My wife's like, it's a bit goofy. I'm like, yeah, but I'm kind of into it. We finished it. Loved the live action One Piece. Loved the live. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. And you guys watch it? No, not yet. I have not. No. Ah, oh, it's delightful. Delightful. And it, it was it was just showed you like you look at after Cowboy Bebop, people were like, Netflix should never be allowed to do any live action adaptations again. And then could they did everything wrong with that like you could even make it to the first five minutes because the pacing and stuff and i like love john cho i think that would have been a great casting for a different point in cowboy bebop's career <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? and, and, but anyhow uh that being said i do have a pick i do have a pick Go. something that i dismissed outright that i'm like uh, i don't like it's i don't like and i blame maybe part of the, the description of it whatever but man, I really enjoyed this. They did two seasons of this. I hope they do another one. Britt Marling and uh, Bash, uh, his last name, the OA. Have you watched the OA? I was that a was that a uh, 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 Wachowski's? No, no. This was Britt Marling co-wrote this with Z- Zal Batmanjali. Uh, per- sorry for mispronouncing his name. They've done a few. They have, she has co-written a number of really interesting sort of sci-fi stuff. And so she did a movie once called The Sound of My Voice and then kind of picked up some of those themes here, I think, in that and this and the OA. And basically the, the premise is a blind girl goes missing, shows up several years later and can now see. Oh, I, you know what? I think to- I think we reported on this on Cord Killers uh, before it came out, but, but uh, I, I don't know that I ever saw it. Well, I I recommend it. Um, I again, she took they took kind of a premise they did from I think Sound of My Voice a bit, but um, I really dug this. I really dug this. Um, and they did season one and season two. Um, I, I I they did a really tight season two and where it ends. Like I can't wait for you to watch this because it's effing cool. Um, and I will tell you the conceit is like. The, it, it, I will, and I would say the thing that made me hesitate because, like, when they say, "Oh, is their story true or is it not true or whatever?" Like, yeah, no, it's a science fiction film. It's an effort science fiction yeah. show. It's, so it's it's not. I hate that. Like, oh, the Martian child. Like, I don't want to spend two hours to wait for you to tell me if this thing is you know, real or not. Like, I want to get I want to get invested. Good science fiction to me is like, what if this thing is true? And so, uh, DOA. I really dug it. Cool. It's, uh, it's, they, they compared it to Stranger Things, which I get why, but it's an unfavorable sort of comparison. But it is a, if you like, I don't know. I, I put it in like the category of like severance or whatnot, or like Homecoming. I used okay. to Homecoming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Way, Homecoming was great. Way, way better than Homecoming. Way okay. better than Homecoming. Um, Homecoming is really well well done. I couldn't get it. I hadn't started to, yeah, but like, again, I like this. Big fan. Gentlemen? Yeah. It's been weird. Now I'm going to fade it out so I don't have to edit. Look at that. Oh, I got this. I was delighted. Oh, no, you talked over it. I have to edit it now. (laughs) I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave that in. <laughs> That'll be how the t- how the MP3 ends. <laughs> oh, we're clean now. <laughs> I was delighted to be wrong about the OA. I really had written off. It's like this looks like some twee, and it's a bit twee, but it's just delightful. Really, really, 
you could see that she and and Bat had like just talked about these ideas through and through, and they did the what if this is true, then this is true. What if this, this, what if that? Uh, do you guys want to hang around and do an after things, or are we yeah. uh, on a tight schedule? Or okay, well then I uh, like to do an after things. Yeah, you guys, you guys can start. I got to take a. Uh, uh, actually, yeah. Here, I'll just throw this on and put some music, and we'll we'll reconvene here shortly. All right. Justin looks like a 70s investigative journalist or a cop. A, a fit one who's ready to... Yeah. He's tough on crime and soft on his daughters. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How old's... It? Like, he's tough on crime and kind to his children. Whatever. All right. You still there? when you smell like Old Spice Swagger. Today is the 23rd of November 2023, and Gaza is still under the fire and under the war. This war which left thousands of uh, victims and injuries, and uh, thousands of uh, houses and buildings were destroyed uh, totally. The people here inside Gaza suffer from a humanitarian, a humanitarian crisis where they don't have the ability to afford the basic needs of life like water, electricity, and food. Today, on behalf of Oma Relief, we implement the projects of preparing hot, hot meals uh, to distribute these hot meals to the needy people uh, in Al Baghazi camp. The people in this camp, which contains uh, thousands of displaced people from different areas uh, from Gaza, especially from the north of Gaza. Thank you for your support. Thanks for Oma Relief and for Alpha for their uh, efforts uh, to support the Palestinian people and uh, especially Gaza Strip. And we hope you to give more where the people in need for your help and your aid. I have no idea what that was.
ago. Um, it's been really wild to relearn all this switching shit. <laughs> No, yeah, I, I, I did. Yeah, actually, fair enough. <laughs> but it's getting, uh, it's getting tighter. Oh hell yeah. Uh, okay, all right. You guys ready to get started? Let's go. All right, I'm gonna count you in, Andrew. Coming up. Hold on, I had a cert in my mouth, and you ruined it. Mm. Ruined it, Brian. I had to throw away my lifesaver. Are you happy now? <laughs> Three. Two, hold on, wait, three, two, and. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. And Justin Robert Young. It's me. I'm back. Uh, Justin, you are my favorite 1970s TV detective. It's you know I I, I feel like I've always kind of had this look so let's just steer into it let's just you know uh, 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 I'm just gonna let the hair just keep growing uh, 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 the mustache is gonna become handlebars and I'm just gonna start playing bass yeah, it works it works yeah um, uh what are our plans for this year uh get back to work it's been a lot of I've been doing a lot of not working for two months. <laughs> I've been a, d doing a lot of crash course learning. I'm excited to get to work. I'm excited to get back to shooting. I'm excited to get back to uh, teaching. I'm excited to get back to uh, hosting events and whatnot. It's going to be like, uh, let's go, let's go, let's go. What about you guys? Uh, well, wait, hold on. I want to stay on you uh -oh. we're, we're working. Because I mean, look, you you had there's there's a lot of you know you've had a lot of uh, uh, shakeups uh, shakeups here. Yep. yep. Uh, uh, you've you've mentioned and and I think you've uh, you were saying right before we went live that it's been a bit of a bear relearning. Uh, you said relearning, and I I think I gently corrected. No, you you never worked on that before. <laughs> yeah. All, all you, of that equipment, never, all of that you, software. You have no history with it. You are just straight just straight up, up learning. Learning. Uh, uh, you know what? Let let let's talk about this. Let's steer into productivity. I think I mentioned a version of this earlier, but um, we during the main show were talking about uh, the productivity benefits with Chat GPT four. Um, it's next level. Like the moment I want to ask anybody anything, I just hit the action button and I say, I am staring at a blank. And, and then if it says, well, unless I know the settings, I can't help. Uh, then I'm like, here's a picture of the settings. And it's like, oh, you need to turn on this, flip this down. You could do this. And then um, there are little turns of phrases like, what are best practices for this? And then when you hear something that doesn't fit, you can push back and say, I don't think you're right. Can you do some research? And then it will go out and come out with a, come back with an updated take on what I need to do. It's uh, the acceleration of the learning curve for production has been just, just utterly supernatural. Do, do you think me. that you would be able to be at the point you are right now in terms of the learning curve with, uh, uh, your software and your hardware that you have here, if it were not for ChatGPT4? Um, not without, I, I think I could be where I am now if I spent money, but money is tight as, as you know, we talked about, you know, it's so like, what, 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 what would you, what, what, what money did you save? Uh, like, like where, where would you have spent it in another world where this technology isn't here and it is not, erasing that expenditure what would the expenditure have been it would have been just hire some other uh black box human to take gotcha. over the so previous bring up bring in another right. another person that has a familiarity with these things and, and then and then and then i would be left just as brittle and not understanding as i was beforehand and now it, it you know yeah it's like uh in fact you can see this when we do the bones podcast justin the bonus podcast for great night uh we've been constantly kind of like nudging like farther and farther out of the comfort zone uh you know first just with 
okay, I know how to do this. I can get this out. And then, you know, out at the porch and, and, and on and on and on. And then now uh, I can kind of see the end of the journey where it's like, oh, I'm going to come up with a nomenclature that makes sense for everything. And then we're going to re start replacing equipment. It's, it's, it's delightful because um, even if it's not the perfect answer to everything, it is enough for me to know when I need expertise and when I have good enough. Like for example, right now, as we're broadcasting this right now, we're using the great night setup and it says the word great night all over it. But guess what? Uh, I'm aware that everybody's hearing this uh, over audio. So it doesn't matter. And the people who are watching are all aware that, you know, the, the, the channel is the night attack channel, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and we trust them to not just spam the chat with, why does it say great night? Uh, okay. We trust them to not do that. Uh, to yeah, not no. repeatedly over and over and over write, why does it say great night? Uh, and you know what? And even if they did, that would be fine because mm -hmm. it won't make it into the audio. <laughs> it won't. It won't. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, but that but but th that's that's interesting because it, it it does draw a psychological barrier that from your point of view, knowing yourself and knowing what the fiscal situation of the company is, there is a world in which you don't have this robotic assistant that has infinite patience and uh, a tremendous acumen to solve these problems, where you are in this situation, you look at the problems that are uh. That, that, that are in front of you and you just say, ah, you want to know what cheaper, even if I can't afford it, it it's going to be faster and cheaper to bring somebody in. Well, uh, uh, very much so. And, um, and that infinite patience, that ability to, uh, it's like, like, like uh, when another human is uh, impatient with you, it shapes the way you interact with them. And you're like, well, that was painful. Uh, I'll be, uh, uh, is it recalcitrant or hesitant uh, uh, to engage with that again? Hesitant, but it's, hesitant would be. Hes hesitant, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, uh, uh, man, an AI, infinite patience. And, and, and it's, it's incredible. That's what a lot of the um, educators that I spoke with uh, when I was contracting for OpenAI, that was something that they, that they said. That, and that's something that you can't fully understand unless you're vulnerable. That having a resource that has infinite patience to get you from here to there is just huge. I mean, like if, if you think about the gaps in education from a parenting perspective, really a lot of it, some of its compassion, some of its intelligence from the parents, but how much of it is really just patience to sit down with your kid and just wait for them to, to circle around to, to the answer so they can figure it out and you can go on that journey and they can cement it in their mind. That is now there for everybody. Uh, and, and I think in your case specifically, it made you a, a, a better steward of your craft. Well, and, and I didn't realize the potency of it until I think a few weeks ago, my recommendation was just talk to chat GPT on the app and uh, insist that you only stick to whatever language you're trying to learn. Like um, uh, I think I told the story of like uh, uh, only using Spanish. I was like, uh, 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 solamente español, por favor. Uh, and, and it's like, okay. And I'm like, and, and I was trying to access the word for rooster in Spanish. And so what I had to say was in Spanish, a version of it's the food that is a uh, chicken, but it's the one that says cockadoodle do in the, in la mañana and so on. And it's like, oh, you mean a rooster. El Gallo and uh, getting getting into that headspace and having that patience is incredible. It's 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 transformative. I keep thinking about as I I go back and forth and use this stuff. You know, Microsoft right now they just announced that they're going to be building a uh, a co-pilot button that they're going to put it in all the Microsoft hardware, so it'll be a button yep. you press and. I've been building apps now, and one of the things I've been putting in there is like a a little auto AI autocomplete for something. Like I have a project with my wife, which is a story composer, an AI story composing tool. 
in different steps, I'm like, oh, well, here's the button you press if you just want it to make a guess at what should goes in there. We're only, we're, we're barely a year into the, you know, the wide scale adoption of AI for doing knowledge tasks and just beginning to figure out the shape and interface and how these things work. And as crude as these tools are, and the fact that ChatGPT is just this general purpose AI that's not even fine tuned, specific tax, tasks is as useful as it is, makes, and we think about some of these open source models, which are getting fine tuned and getting really good capabilities. I don't even know what it's going to be like a year or two years from now when you think about that. Like you, Brian, you talked about your camera, like, hey, trying to figure out the setting. Like there might be a button. You, I, I've talked about the idea of if I wanted to create a company, I'd create a company and put a QR code on the thing. You'd scan it and chat GPT would just tell you everything you wanted to know about it. But you might just get to the point where it's just that button where you just click it on the device. How the hell do I use you? What do I do? You know, the talking toaster, you know, the idea well, that. And, and, and there's a bit of, it's, it's a strange thing because, um, and this will be a little bit poetical hippie talk, but um, the whole world got a little bit introverted uh, between wearing masks over their face and staying at home and the world being on fire and all that stuff. Um, and then, but, but it feels like we're getting more extroverted now. Uh, and meanwhile, at the exact same time, AI, because they're large language models, like you can now just extrovert your way through waving your hands and explaining what you want and a program gets programmed in python where you can wave your hands and you can get the exact photo that you want that represents the thing um it 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 uh to be honest it, it, uh, to me this is i'm only speaking for me it feels like coming out of a, a long hibernation and it feels really really good i i got i'll share something kind of funny it's not a major holy cow thing but uh, there was a, uh, article on hacker news where somebody had pointed out, they made a, a one D version of Pac-Man, right? Oh, I, 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 just, uh, is this the one that, that you showed me when I was out there or no, this came out like this week. Okay. This was, All this right. was one D Pac-Man. Um, let me pull this up. Um, one D Pac-Man. Pac so, uh, uh, for one uh, D it was like, it, it, imagine a single line that uh, only through parallax, by looking left, looking right, you could kind of kind of get a sense of where you are, right? Is, 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 is yeah, that you correct? can move along. You can move along, say like an X axis in this case. So, yeah. oh my God, it really is one D. It's just one line. Yeah, and it's actually fun. You know, it's actually kind of like a flappy bird today. So uh, I'm not good at it. I was just, I was like, oh, this, this was fun. And then I'm like, I'm in the middle of coding something and I'm waiting for GPT-4 to take really long to process stuff. So I go into, uh, I go into <laughs> chat GPT and I'm like, can I make one, can I make a 1D Grand Theft Auto? I built this yesterday. Oh my well, God. <laughs> it is not good. But it is. Just oh my this, god, this is amazing! I use. I have had any sound effects, but uh, I was. It was all GPT four getting it to code and say, okay, have the police car follow, put money bags there, and it counts the money. I could. I could give. Literally, this was not. I was building three other things yesterday. This was just a little bit here. Oh yeah, add this. Add this. Go back to whatever it was. I can't even. I hard. It was not like even a project. It was just an afterthought. And if we weren't doing the show right now, I would have forgotten that I've made it. Yeah. That was GPD-4. That's wild. That's insane. If I, and if I spent time on it, I could actually put in sound effects and levels and stuff. I, I could probably in a weekend make a pretty cool 1D GTA, you know, with going and getting like a... I actually played with having Dolly create like some sprites and stuff, but that's the world we're in. Yeah. Well, And, and, and it's only getting more so right yeah i you know we one of the things that's become really good is like i think that now is the best time to be a creative a creative who understands and embraces technology well, and, and that that is that is the counterintuitive thing that uh you, you you can't force artists to see what what i think the three of us see which is the incredible opportunity uh because because many of them are establishing themselves in their craft and they're terrified. Uh, all they know is thing can do thing good. And it's like, meanwhile, I think all three of us have experienced um, 
creative projects as as the editor, as the director, as the producer, as uh, we know what it's like to have a writer's room or to have interns that are pretty good but not perfect at all times. Um, and all of those soft skills, that extroversion and stuff, that big vision, the ability to say, well, let's begin with, here's our target, here's our goal, let's begin with one thing. Can you show me a cloud? Great. This is a story about a cloud that becomes a machine robot that goes to the moon. We'll get there eventually, but for now, what would a cloud machine look like? And then, and then, and then, uh, 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 the, that, that, those gentle nudges with linguistics, um, I, I, I wish more people understood how valuable those skills are going to be and continue, will continue to be. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the, I mean, these tools unlock a lot. And I, I was thinking back about I, the previous show, we discussed Rebel Moon and how, you know, I remember watching this and I knew, you know, we know Larry Fong and Larry Fong had been DP on, think, on some really good looking Zack Snyder films. And then I looked- Sucker Punch and so the, on. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, yeah, 300 and like, look to see who was, who was the DP on Rebel Moon because it looks horrible and it was, Zack Snyder. It was just Zack Snyder did it. And it just, and and I'm like, this is bad. And I watched the interview where he's talking about how, well, I didn't want to use DP. Would it be fair to him? Because I'd be doing things that get them fired. I'm like, yes, your, your super, super shallow depth of field makes everything feel like a fan film. Like you couldn't afford to do your CGI. So you had to blur the background, whatever. And I think about like where these tools, like they're going to amplify. If you have like right now, you know, there is, you know, there's like an entire like Nigerian film industry. You know, there there are kids in Haiti who want to make movies and who want to make stuff and may have the most amazing ideas for storytelling, but they're limited by, you know, access to tools and things like that. But when all of a sudden your phone, your phone now, as we've seen through TikTok and social media, there's a lot of really funny, talented people around the world. They're not all in, you know, 10 square miles of LA. Um, and as these tools become better and better, we are going to see some amazing things come out of the places we didn't suspect. Yeah. I mean, it is a, a true democratization of a lot of these things that were specialized. And I can understand why some artists are are scared of it. I suspect that uh, people will realize very quickly that these are tools to be taken advantage of. And uh, uh, they they should. Well, you you look at if you're I, I think the people that have the most to concern are the people who have the most invested in things being the way they are. And that yeah. can be production companies and studios like reality TV was devastating in many ways to the TV industry because networks realized they could pay a lot less for content and, you know, people had to figure out how to get things made and whatever. And then. You know, streaming, it was, I thought, I thought I saw a really good argument with the problem of like, like the, what's the problem with Star Wars films and Star Wars TV shows right now is Disney sees them as content and yeah. not as films and television shows. And I think that the, I know that people like some of the people who were like, you look at the writer strikes, like a lot of writers are worried about AI and like, oh, am I going to get replaced by, AI? I'm like, if, if an AI can replace you creatively, Whoops. you didn't have, <laughs> yeah, you didn't have a lot to offer creatively. Yeah. And not to mean that, and, and not to mean you couldn't, it's just that that's part of the problem with the system is it like, I started watching some episodic TV show last night, trying to get into it and it's not bad, but like, I know how to do, I know how to do architecture for long form storytelling with AI. I know how to, Basically, if you want to do 20 minute, 30 minute, 40 minute content, how you actually can do that. And I watch these things and I go, I could have an AI build this. Like yeah. I could have an AI write this. And but I can have an AI write that show. But if you said, you know, can I get an AI to write, you know, the new latest season of Fargo? No, no, I couldn't. Because there's very there, there some are the TV writing's interesting. So here's the thing about TV. This is the thing people often don't think about TV. TV different versus film. And streaming can be all over the place. TV was became evolved into an assembly line. With the idea of it, I can put any director in there and I can give them the script and they will know medium shot, close-up shot, wide shot. 
I can put any writer there and they will know that this is going to be act one tease is going to be exactly three minutes long, which means this exchange, you look at, you look at cop shows and how, how procedure, how, how formulaic they are. We get the case, we watch the murder, the thing takes place, the witness, blah, 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 gets away. Assume next thing introduced to the detectives, then the first three witnesses, you know, you follow that for me and you go like, Oh yeah, that's why, these things are easy. Wire, the wire throws things out the window. Breaking Bad generally would throw things out the window. Those shows became bad. Not those shows, but a lot of shows do become bad over time once they evolved into the formula. The Simpsons got bad once they said this is the Simpsons formula and they could yeah. plug any kind of writer into it. They got away from the days when you had Conan O'Brien and other people in there always trying to change up the formula. And so TV writing at its worst is extremely it was designed by it really was designed so the idea that i could throw this script over the wall into the studio and it would turn out pretty much exactly the same way if i threw it over any other wall you know i was thinking about I was, I was thinking about this today because i was thinking a lot about legion uh, after watching fargo and and you know the the good mm. and the bad of legion legion which... is the Noah holly version of the marvel comics character legion absolutely yeah and i was like Oh, you want to know what's rad about Legion is like if Legion showed up in an Avengers movie, if like that character showed up, I would be pumped to see how they interacted with other characters. And that means the problem with the modern Marvel movies is they're going to do an Avengers movie and all their TV shows and movies feel the exact same. So I know exactly what those interactions are going to be. I know exactly what the tone of the movie is going to be. I know exactly how the villain's going to act. And I know exactly how the, the story is going to be uh, resolved. There were elements of those earlier phases where I remember in Infinity War, that there ends with like a very dark kind of uh, 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 realistic or gritty scene. And then it's like cut to the guardians of the galaxy and red bone is playing. And it's like that moment felt like a tone shift and almost like a punctuation on a sentence that brought me into Space. a new sentence. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, like, Oh cool. Wow. These characters, these worlds are about to the, this gritty spy thriller is going to run into star Wars. Like that's, Dirty Harry's going to meet Han Solo. That's cool. I don't I have no idea what's going to happen. This is really exciting. This is really really cool. And and when it, it's like I don't know. There there just is that expectation with your brain of can I see to the end of this? Do I know what's going to happen and and part of the glut of content that we got over the last 5 years was really just like Oh, okay. Yeah, I know exactly what this documentary series is going to be. And I know I can skip episodes three and four because they're going to follow something really stupid and I could probably just skip to the end and it'd be fine. I know what I know what this spooky movie is going to be. I know what this series, this, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> I was looking at like some of the canceled series that happened through the strike and it was like, oh, you know, Paramount Plus did a prequel series about the origin of the pink ladies in Greece. Yeah. <laughs> Because they did, and I'll bet you I can guess how it was, because it was probably like every other derivative, uh, uh, we just need to keep this IP spinning. There was, when Ahsoka came out, and I, I, I think David Filoni seems like a very nice guy, and if I have questions about Star Wars lore... I'm going to go to him. Yeah. Uh, but when Ahsoka came out, you know, they announced all this different, you know, Star Wars content. And I still remember, I think I said it on this microphone when Disney bought Marvel, Disney bought Star Wars and, and the worry. And I'm like, no, no, no. Disney has so much invested in it. They'll get it right, guys. They'll get it right. <laughs> and so I've said some stupid things, but that, that ranks up there. You know, watching Ahsoka where the, First episode, first 20 minutes, the premise gets set up. And I'm like, man, if this ends and Thrawn comes, Thrawn's coming to this galaxy, I know that. And if somebody's stuck on the other side, I'm going to be very upset because it seems like this is so formulaic and predictable. But then, and then the, the storytelling where like, you see this with like, 
this is Marvel does this now too. Like, so you take Sabine. Sabine does horrific, horrible, horrible, horrible things in that show. Things that are like, hey, I gave them this thing because I wanted to bring Ezra. I did this, and she's always forgiven. I'm like, she's horrible. She she she's un- irredeemable by the actions. And then it's like the Marvel formula. Like you watch that with like uh, Wakanda Forever, and like Namor is like murdering innocent people and stuff and kills the queen and like, yeah, but we needed to be a good guy at the end. So they're just all, everything's cool. And you're like, what? There are no consequences. You know, you remember that, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, and they also ruined his character. (laughs) I know. Like, yeah, they did. They did like, they show up and remember like in the scene they're, they're chasing after, you know, the, the, the car chase whatever and cops are getting people are getting killed they go to wakanda they murder people murder the queen all this in the end it's like why well, forgive you and was this weird kind of like anyhow because we need him to be there i'm like there are no consequences to and it's when nothing means anything nothing means anything and and i'd say that's my problem a lot well, and that's writing, like they go compare that to the end of civil war which introduces yeah. black panther where the end is one of the most badass things you've ever seen is you realize that Baron Zemo, this has literally just been a plot for him to let the heroes kill each other and he's about to kill himself and Black Panther catches the bullet so he doesn't have the joy of killing himself because that's the true punishment. And it's like, that's amazing. What a, what then, a great way then, to resolve. Then Falcon and Winter Soldier. And then we get all of that undone. And like there there was a couple uh US like the the Wyatt Russell character was kind of in there. There's a point where like you know he kills a guy at the shield and you're kind of like kind of moment that you look at that show, like Zemo is now a laughable sidekick. Yeah. This time. <laughs> like, it's just like, oh cool. I guess sure, just undo the most badass thing that you could do. Like because the heroes fighting each other contrived idea, right? It's hard to do. It's hard to pull off in a way that you can, that make it feel real and then have a justification for it. Other than you, they were infected by a virus. They were infected by virus (laughs) or somebody's a double agent or someone's a scrawl or something like that. Like it's hard to do to do it, have that conflict feel real. And then do the meta element of like, yes, it was set up. There was a villain. It is this guy. And now that he's completed, he wins. He wins. As far when he's sitting on that mountain, he's like, finally, I won. I'm going to kill myself. Nope. Gotcha. Like, so great. And then you're right. And then it just takes all the air out of, out of the balloon because it's like, oh, you know, Daniel Brühl can do comedy. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's frustrating. So back to the topic of AI, like, I think that, yeah, I think 80% of the industry is in trouble. Good. Good. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 glad. Like based I based on what I, based on our research at the movie theaters. <laughs> I don't I like if you if you gave me, you know, three weeks in chat GPT, we could have read we could have created a better plot for Ahsoka. We could have yeah. done better. We we could have because we could put little tests in there and things like this. Secret war uh, secret invasion. Jeez! Whoa, whoa, whoa! You know what? Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand you to the screen. I'm gonna see if I can backlight Justin to make him look better. <laughs> no, I mean that was. I think we we came up on the phone. We came up with a better plot for Secret Invasion in like five seconds, and it was yeah. Uh, well, the uh, same money, even in reshooting, whatever the yeah. even yeah. pitch everything you've done. Get yeah. all those actors because the talent in that in that cast was insane. Like, like they had a, 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 an exceptional cast in that movie, put them all in the white house. Somebody dies. All we know is that one's a scroll and now, and now play that out, have an outside plot and an inside plot as they're trying to go back and forth and figure out. And they're trying to keep it from getting out in the media. Like, there's a million things you can do that actually plays on everything that makes the scrolls interesting uh, uh, that has nothing to do with the super scroll and the absolutely just mind numbing. Well, number one, it wasn't even a spy movie, which is the other thing. No, the no, point there was no spying. There, there was, was no, no spying. spying. There was no cat and mouse. It was just an action adventure movie that had or series that had no suspense whatsoever. 
at all. And I get, kept hearing that, like, oh, because of the Russia events, we had to change. What did you have to change? <laughs> you know, like, like I was excused. I so I I think we are in an amazing point. I think these tools, when used right, can do really, really cool things. And I think they have better. Uh, oh, Lord of the Rings. Oh, Rings of Power. Oh, I still haven't seen that. And no one, and no one can is, make me. The Rings of Power is a great example of we're going to shove a bunch of people into the room. And number of I'm and I'm not like oh you need to be like I think I think Dave nobody loves Star Wars more than David Filoni but I don't think Dave Filoni is a showrunner at this point right now is really is a writer for live action is writing what I think he could be writing much more stronger more great stuff at some yeah. point but but the, what I'm seeing right now is just not there I think he's, he's clearly a creative guy but like Rings of Power was an example of where. It's IP. It's literally like, what do we do with this IP? What do yeah. we do with this IP? We got IP. I got some IP. And it's, it's, you watch the beginning, like, well, I guess that guy's Sauron, you know, and I guess <laughs> that's, that's Gandalf, right? And they're like, oh, no, maybe they're not. Maybe they are. Maybe then you get to the end. Yep. He's Sauron. He's Gandalf. And by the way, Gladriel is a complete idiot and a sociopath. Um, but we won't hold her accountable for this. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, and that's ultimately the problem with fantasy in general is that it's like, especially an IP fantasy genre, or a, a, an IP fantasy project like that is you, I don't know. A wise man once well, told my, me, a, a wise man once told me that a lot of superhero movies suck because some people just like to root for uniforms. <laughs> well, there's, there's with Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, like part of the issue there was I remember when they bought they bought like the rights to all this backstory lore. I'm like, you didn't buy the stories. That's the yeah. problem. The stories were the good part. And like you bought the rights to put something into that genre, which meant you bought, you paid half a billion or whatever they paid for the rights or 100, 200 million. You paid to have people now compare you to Peter Jackson's greatest work with Lord of the Rings. Yes. You've now played yourself to say, we, we are going to compete with the most talented, pathological, obsessive nerd ever to attack a large genre IP and create, I still think Lord of the Rings is the greatest film adaptation of fantasy works ever done. And nothing, now like, nothing yeah, close. we're going to throw our hat in the ring, you know? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I mean, not only that, but let's do it while we're also getting compared to Game of Thrones. Which not yeah. only achieved gigantic heights for their adaptation, but then also screwed it up. So now everybody's like, well, don't screw it up like this thing at the end. So it's yeah, I, the worst possible scenario that you go we into. Need in season seven Game of Thrones, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it just talk about a lack of an ability to win. If you don't have somebody who's coming in with the greatest Lord of the Rings pitch of all time. Like, if you don't have that in your back pocket and you say, all right, well, what IP do we need to buy to make these characters like what, what you need them to be, which they didn't, they bought the IP and then they built a writer's room and said, here's some Legos, build a Lego set, go. And that's, that's, that's the problem because like really, really good writer directors are hard to find. Yeah. Really good. And, and I think that, Hollywood should be making a lot more bets. Like if you ask me what streaming should be doing is yeah, I watched yeah, <laughs> instead of doing bright and doing rebel moon and these things do 10 more $15 million films, find your new yeah. James guns, find, find these people are out there. You know, they're out there, you know, and, and, you know, do more anthology series so you can build up directors. Like, do more anthology stuff where people can come in and even do it as a loss leader. You know, that was my problem. Like, you know, Am you know Apple tried to do amazing stories, and then like they tried. There was also the remake of Twilight Zone, where I remember watching Twilight Zone. I knew people worked on it. I'm like, did any of you ever effing watch an episode of Twilight Zone? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know. But it's just, I, it's just writers who want to write who have no love for the genre don't get the genre. Well, that's the other problem with all this stuff is that it's like, well, you don't actually like this stuff. You don't know why it's cool. You don't know why it's good. You know, you just like you walk in and you're like, oh, I don't know. Maybe you should work at a bakery. Yeah, I get what, I get. what if Dr. Doom was a blogger? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that's so this is what happens too. Let me tell you the inside is, is you watch some of these shows and I've heard this, but it's like, I'll hear, oh yeah, so-and-so she's working on this show. I'm like, why are they on that show? They don't even read comics or like this stuff. It's well, they really, this person wrote some good touching thing or whatever, some script, they liked it. And so some, some execs like, oh, let's get this person to the writer's room to bring this perspective or to bring this yeah. thing in there. And then you get a writer's room with a bunch of people could give an F about really that storytelling. Well, and that's the other, the other thing is, uh, look, there were elements that I liked about She-Hulk. Um, but you know, when the, the, the showrunner is saying like, yeah, we just kind of realized once we had the rooms assembled that we're, no one's good at writing courtroom scenes. So we're just going to kind of write around the fact that she's a lawyer and this is kind of supposed to be a, like an Ally McBeal sort of thing. And it's like, it's like, okay. Okay. Well, but 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 even Ally McBeal was good at the courtroom lawyer things. Exactly. Right? That's my point. Is that it's like, all right, let's do Ally McBeal, but she she Hulk, but also we can't do any kind of fun procedurally courtroom things that involve she Hulk. There were like two or three of them in the in 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 the series, uh, and again, there were elements I liked. I, I wasn't I wasn't totally down on she Hulk. I mean, at least compared to some of the other stuff, but it's 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 a sign that maybe you don't care and you don't understand that like intellectual property is yes, good because people are plugged in to see it, but it's also good because it was captivated imaginations. You know, it, it got people thinking, it got people really, really into certain stuff. And there are ways that that happened that you should be amplifying, that you should be finding and making bigger and, and realer. Like, X-Men, that first X-Men movie, for all the, you know, there's flaws in it, but it nailed a great element of X-Men. The love triangle between Jean Grey and Wolverine and, and Cyclops. Cyclops. Yeah, That's like, all right, charismatic actors, you throw them all in a room, Wolverine's badass, Scott Summers is kind of boring, but he's the leader, and Jean Grey is this mysterious wild card. Let's, it got that right, let's move forward. Magneto and Professor X. Why are they interesting together? Let's have. Uh, the turns first... out they both have the exact same goal. Just one's willing to go a little bit farther and, than the and, other. And, and yeah. the first scene where where they're together, we get it. Boom! Like we now understand it. They have a conversation that makes you get these people are 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 very very different and they have different goals. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, uh, since. Um, uh, uh, Kang died on the way back to his home planet by way of uh, <laughs> uh, a, a, a Manhattan jury. Uh, you know, uh, it looks like they're gonna they're gonna do something different for uh, you know. I don't know. I think if Marvel had their druthers, they'd probably just want to hit reset on a lot of stuff. To be were... honest, they have that opportunity. There's a little property called Fantastic Four that all I all you have to do is set everything in 1960s. Like go back to the golden age well, and just it's... just keep us there. And who knows what the future holds? But it's not. I the the problem with Marvel, in in my opinion, and and by the way, too, like one of the things is we often attribute like 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 ah, oh, Brian Singer X Men. That was Tom DeSanta who came up with the idea of making like Magneto Jewish and that element yeah. and all that. And just we often Hollywood likes to just give somebody credit, and sometimes they give the wrong. It's easier if I pretend it was this guy and we hire that guy, then we problem solved. What um, could go wrong with continuing to give Brian oh Singer more power? And I will, my, the Brian Singer stories I have heard that I've never seen in print from people that worked with him are insane. Yeah. Insane. But anyhow, um, the problem though is, is that we can, we could say like, Hey, you know, they're, they're, you know, maybe cause now John Majors is out, you know, they're going to bring in Dr. Doom or they're going to do this or whatever. It's still the same people making it. You yes. can throw the best idea at them. It's not going to matter because, you know, you, I could, I, she Hulk, I couldn't get it. I didn't know what it was. I, I was excited at first. And then I saw the CG. I'm like, oh. And then I hear like, oh, the end is some meta thing with a robot, Kevin Feige. I'm like, are you effing kidding me? Like, you know, I've, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of at my limit with the deconstruction of the narrative with the whole Loki series. And I was like, yeah, these are people who don't want to write the show. Uh, uh, yeah, don't worry. They make sure that they show the literal writer's room. 
in that scene uh, before they. Oh no, I've seen that scene. Yeah. I've seen that okay. clip. I've yeah. seen that. Like, like literally, let's let's. How much do we hate? I mean, the suspension of disbelief is a thing that I remember with Marvel when they did Iron Man, right? And so Iron Man comes out, right? And we're like, okay, cool. This is the new. They're trying to do the new stuff. There was the Hulk, you know, yep. which the kind of side kind the of Ed, the Hulk Ed Norton thing. Hulk, right? And then <clears throat> the big thing, the big thing was, I remember the movie that set and made the Marvel universe possible and it's flawed was Thor. Yes. Because Thor had to introduce gods and magic and everything else and did it. it did and it, it nailed it. And they built yeah, and then we kept building on this, and then now they get into this thing of like, well, now we want to deconstruct all that and remind you that you're just watching a movie or a TV show. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, cool. and look, it, it's it's partly because Deadpool hit, and I think that a lot of that stuff was greenlit before the merger was final, and like, uh, so Meta's in, so let's have our Meta hero, and and She Hulk has a Meta past, so uh, I don't know. I mean, there's. There's elements for it, but the, the, at the end of the day, the problem is, is that it's like, it all feels the exact same. Every single thing feels the exact same, and none of it's particularly good. It's not like even I'm getting a really good movie that I really, really like over and over and over again. Like, I'm getting Thor The Dark World over and Actually, yeah, whatever. Uh, even better than Thor, or worse than Thor The Dark World. There, there are elements of Thor The Dark World I actually liked. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, uh, just same, same. Brian, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm ready for, uh, I hate to say it, uh, Steven Spielberg nailed it years ago when he predicted, he, he wasn't condemning, he was predicting that superhero movies were going to go the way of the cowboy western. We were going to love them very intensely for a certain amount of time, and then we were all going to move on and I'd hate to believe it, but it seems like he's right. I mean, in terms of I the don't... dominant run, I think like, but I, I don't know that it was because the audience got tired of it. I think it's because the project started to stink. Yeah. I, I, I think they just got bad. Like I look at the, the storytelling was stronger before and it became formulaic this, but you could really look at the outputs two studios between Marvel you know, in DC and the output, what they've been doing have been just from a narrative point of view have gotten worse and worse. You do get like, I didn't like guardians of three people like guardians three. That's fine. I don't have an issue. Um, I think the boys is still great. The boys I think is doing really, really good subversive sort of stuff. I like Gen V, you know, I think, I think there's many more great stories to be told I think the problem was is just that the really talented, you know, writers or stuff are just either not getting empowered or not on these projects. I mean, that's ultimately here's my problem with the Marvel stuff is there was a leak or a rumor about what the Avengers cast was going to be in the next Avengers movie. And it's grim. <laughs> like it is a yeah. bunch of people that I don't care about at oh, all. Yeah. Like I, I don't uh, 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 like Spider-Man wasn't in it. It was just all the Disney Plus gang, plus Captain Marvel. Yeah, and I mean, I'll say this too. Like, I think Spider-Man crossed the multiverse. Those things are, I, I didn't like it as much as the first, but it's great. It's great. Like, if you said, if you told me, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, you're, you're younger. talking about the Lord Miller one, not the, uh, the, uh, no way home right. or the, whatever yeah yeah the the, the animated one, one. across the spider-verse yeah uh the joaquin de santos and justin k thompson kim powers directed yeah um i would say that like if you told me they were doing a if lord and miller were going to direct instead of just produce like those if lord and miller were going to direct a live action miles morales film or spider gwen yeah that it would be through there people are excited about craven and i don't know how i feel about craven but like I think the end people want something good. And I think that those were good. I think those, those, uh, if you told me they were going to do a live action Miles Morales, I think, I think it'd be a billion dollar film. I think it'd be bigger than just another spider Tom Holland, Spider-Man movie. Cause it yeah. just, it just touches an audience. It feels relevant. And so I think the thing is there, I mean, it's, you know, 
Spielberg might be right in a sense that eventually cowboy films became so commoditized and whatnot, but then we reached the end and then all of a sudden Unforgiven pops out of nowhere and you get this idea of going deeper into who these people are. Yeah. Uh, hey, Deadpool. Like, I guarantee you Deadpool is going to do bank. Yes. I mean, it, it, it's going to be the only Marvel movie that comes out this year. Crazy. My picks are good movies. <laughs> my my pick is my new backlighting. I'm I, yeah no yeah you guys were on a jag I'm like guys. well I might I might as well go ahead and just see what it looks like if I give you a bit of a halo there. <laughs> uh, uh, did, you see the, did you see the photo I sent you guys? Okay. Yes yes. Oh I uh, uh no. No, that was a test. You weren't supposed to look at your phone during the show. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, so uh, uh, here's my pick. American Fiction. It's in theaters right now. It stars Jeffrey Wright. It's going to get nominated for a bunch of stuff around Oscar time. It is the story of an author who teaches at a university uh, who finds himself disillusioned, played by Jeffrey Wright, finds himself disillusioned about the state of modern fiction, specifically race-based fiction. Uh, and after being after a few inciting incidents, decides in a fit of rage to write a book that is, in his mind, a parody of this type of genre. And unsurprisingly, it not only gets published, but becomes an absolute literary sensation. Uh, you know, I got quibbles, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, but it's a movie that I like in that it's a movie that's good enough that it's worth talking about and having the kind of conversations that people who love movies like to have uh first time director first time writer adapted from uh another book but uh it's 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 worth seeing and and the cast is really good there are there are moments where some of the actors are that are like together on screen where you're like oh my god this is just an awesome movie they ever tell you i've told you my theory on uh why really brilliant parodists often make the greatest art like uh well, you, you take like uh, uh, yeah, 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 a good parody, if I can guess. Uh, uh, sorry to jump in, but uh, I would assume it's because um, it's kind of you have to be able to steel man what you're making fun of. You have to be able to say it as mm -hmm. good as the source material in order to give some top spin with a parody on there. Heart of Glass by Blondie was a parody of disco music because yeah. you listen to lyrics, it's a parody of disco in the scene. Heart of Glass became the most successful disco song of all time. A uh, couple of uh, some punk rock punk singers decided to parody rap, and we got the Beastie Boys. You know, you look at anything by uh, Lonely Planet and Lonely Island. Those guys, Lonely Island, them too. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I upgraded the Planet, Justin, <laughs> and amazing. And there's this, there's this pattern you'll see sometimes people who do some parody of stuff early on like you said to brian's point like absolutely get the genre understand see every single see the element for genre for what it is and know how to pull those triggers and sometimes find themselves with the biggest hits there are uh yeah it's uh that's not the theme of the movie but no. it might be some of the takeaways go see american yeah. fiction all right andrew we're running out of time you got to pick uh, yeah, I got a pick. Did either of you guys watch Gen V? Uh, no, but I've heard nothing but great things about it. Really? I, I did not expect it to be good at all, but, but that's wonderful to hear. I'm like, for shame, for shame. Watch Gen V. If you want more good stuff, you like the boys. Yeah. How about watch it? And it's the same people making it. It's not like this net, you know, Amazon's like, we're going to let these other people go do this, you know, this Witcher thing that's not connected to the people who, well, what do you want to use that example? It's literally the same team making it, same people yeah. making it, same people show up. It's, 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 you can intersperse these episodes in the boys. Just watch Gen V. Awesome. Okay. I will. Brian. <sighs> Gentlemen. It's been. Wait, no, you have a pick. Oh, no, I think I already gave one. Did I you? I gave like five picks. You said, do you like good movies? Uh, yeah, that was my pick. That was your pick. Good yeah. movies. Yeah, bring them back. I'm really glad that you have to do the show notes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That's my pick. Good movie. That's my time, y'all. All right. Here we go. I'm going to play some music. And then, and, well, you know what? I'm just going to say, uh, it's been after. Ha, I get to do that now, too. Jeez.
another job being taken away. <laughs> uh, okay, we're still streaming, but we're no longer recording. I'll I'll put those in. I'm learning the distribution stream through the thing. Oh, glad we're not recording because our audience is the worst. No, They're the worst. No, 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 no. I mean, the worst at being the worst. They're amazing. Oh, good recovery, Andrew. Good recovery. And thank you, Scrammer00, for saying Gen V is great. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Like, I just, I'm upset with Brian and Justin because. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll get, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Uh, Gen V. That is still have the to thing they the... don't tell you about marriage. So for unmarried folks or people who live alone, this is the thing you don't realize is you have stuff you want to watch and your spouse wants to watch it too. But unfortunately you have to wait for the coincidence of the schedules to watch the thing. But often you're still watching the last thing and a new thing comes out and then. (laughs) It's okay. Disappear into the back. <laughs> I like it. Looks good. Uh, I like I like the, uh, the the stair stepping kind of effect on there. Yeah, there's a, there's a a little bit of uh, a golden ratio curve happening. You know. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, your shot looked fantastic, Andrew. Thank you. I'm my own DP. Yeah. Your regular Zack Snyder. Probably have to tweak the camera on Justin. Add another light. That's fine. Look, we got this. It's gonna look great. It's good. It, it. You know what? It is great. Let's hear it for. Uh. The boys. Yeah. Money over bitches. All right. We'll see you guys. The goons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>